started. Can everyone hear me? I'll take that as I'll take that as a yes. Okay. Uh, my name is David Steele. Um, our topic today is heavy duty backup with PG Backrest. So PG Backrest is a new piece of backup software that you have probably have not heard of before, and we're going to run through features and um, and see how it works. Uh, I'm senior data architect at Crunchy Data Solutions. Um, this is pretty recent. I've been working there since April, uh, but I have been developing with Postgres since 1999. All right, so this is our agenda. Uh, obviously, at some point, we're going to talk about backups, but the first thing we're going to talk about is, is backup in general. Why backup? Um, I want to make a case for that first. Uh, then we'll talk about once you've decided you do definitely need to backup, we'll talk about how to backup. Um, then talk about PG backrest design, performance, uh, there'll be a little philosophy, and then we will have a live demo. All right, so first, why backup? Um, first and foremost, hardware failure. Uh, no amount of redundancy can protect you from this, um, at least on Postgres. So uh, if your master fails, then you know, you're going to have some problems, and you want to make sure that you can recover that to standbys. You might actually have a multi-machine failure. Uh, you might have, um, actually I'll cover corruption later. Um, all these sorts of things can happen. You need to have backups. Uh, even better, continuous backups. Um, the next thing is replication. So uh, when you're doing replication, of course everyone wants to set up streaming replication, but the thing that can happen is your replica will get far enough behind that um, it gets out of sync with the master. Uh, the replica needs to be able to pull the wall segments from someplace and that's when a wall archive comes in handy. Uh, the other thing is if you're bringing up a new replica, rather than doing a base backup of the master, you can actually just recover your last backup from the backup server, bring it up, let it uh, stream the wall that it needs, and then it will sync up with the master and become a streaming replica. Uh, and this puts as little load on the master as possible. Uh, the next thing, of course, is uh, corruption. Um, you know, corruption can be caused by hardware or software. Uh, the trick with corruption is actually figuring out that it happened. Um, so backups will help you recover from corruption, but if you don't discover it until a year down the road, then you've got a bit of a problem. Uh, this obviously is made better by the um, page checksums in Postgres, uh, but still currently there's still no system-wide way to look at an entire database and see whether you have corruption or not. Um, hopefully that's coming. If not, it may be coming in backrest. Uh, the next thing, so these are the sorts of the things, uh, you know, corruption, and hardware failure, replication, these are these are day-to-day -day operations, or I mean, things that can happen. Uh, the next thing is sort of an accident, right? So uh, you dropped a table by accident, or you know you had an update script that dropped it. So it wasn't necessarily someone in production just messing around, um, but you ran an update script. This table's gone. Uh, what do you do? Um, or somehow you've deleted your most important account. Um, you had lots of uh, fun cascades in there, so now all this data is gone. You need to be able to get it back. Um, backups can help you with this. You can bring up the backup, uh, you can export the data that you need, and then bring that back into your production database and you're good to go. Um, replicas don't help you with this because of course if you drop a table on the master that's replicated uh, quickly. You might have replication delay and that may help or you, know, you may not discover it till hours later that the table's gone or the account's gone or something like this. So uh, backups are great for that. Um, another thing backups can be good for is development. So uh, this may not be, you may not be able to do this in all environments because of privacy issues. You may be government or health or whatever. Um, but uh, copies of production databases can make great development databases. Or staging. You, know, you may have a stage server where you bring over a copy of production, stage everything up, make sure that everything works, and then you follow the same procedure on production later. So being able to get exact copies of production onto another database server quickly is a good thing. Um, another thing is reporting. So reporting obviously can be done on streaming replicas, but sometimes you need access to temp tables and other things like that that you can't do on a streaming replica. So one thing you can do is do a daily reporting server where you update the, the server at midnight every day, you bring it up as a normal master so that people can use temp tables and do writes and do other things like that, and you refresh every day. Um, if, you can do, if you can stand to do reporting without the current day's data, a lot of people can. Um, and the last thing is, is forensics. Um, so sometimes there's data that was actually deleted on purpose, but you want to go back and look at it. Um, you know, they, it, 
for whatever reason. I mean, it could be something that, uh, you know, something malicious you're trying to track down. It could just be something interesting. You went, oh, we got rid of that. We did that on purpose, but now we want it back. Um, so you can use your backups for that, depending on how far back in time your backups are. Um, OK, so the next thing, of course, is, is how to backup. So uh, we'll talk about backups a little later. But I think, I think everyone, if you're in this room, you probably think backups are important, or you're at least considering it. Uh, so the next question is, how do you backup? Um, the first thing, of course, is PG dump. Uh, especially with small databases, this is what most people start with. It's very simple. Um, it's very easy. Doing restores is very easy. Uh, PG dump has a couple of problems, though. One is it doesn't scale well. That was weird. <laughs> um. What happened? Oh, OK. Thank you. So PG dump doesn't scale well. So really, as your, if your database goes beyond even, say, a gigabyte, then doing the restores can be quite painful. Uh, and if your database goes beyond 100 gigabytes, then it becomes insanely painful. Because PG dump doesn't actually dump out indexes, so they have to be rebuilt when you bring the database back in. Uh, the other problem with PG dump is that it's really, um, it, re it represents only a point in time in your database. So if you, let's say, you're doing a daily PG dump at midnight, um, your server crashes at 10 p.m., everything's lost. Uh, so you, you restore that PG dump. Well, you've lost now 20 hours of data, uh, or 22 hours of data. So that's a problem. There's no way to play forward and recapture all the changes that happened during the day. Um, the other, uh, and, and lastly, PG dump takes a lot of locks. So if you're doing partitioning or trigger writing or things like that, a lot of those things can't go on while PG dump is running. Um, because it'll, it'll take locks on just about everything in the database, and then you're stuck. You know, you'll, you'll be holding on your partition creation until the end of the PG dump. If you've got a big database, that can be a real problem. Uh, the next thing, of course, is PG ba base backup. This is also built into Postgres. Um, this is a pretty good tool, actually. It does a lot for you. It, it gets you um, a backup. It, gets, it copies all the wall archives for you. Um, a couple problems here still, though. Uh, PG base backup always does a full backup. If you've got a very large database, this can be a problem for you. Uh, the other thing is that it's still not an uh, archive management solution. So even though you get the wall segments you need to make the database consistent, it's not going to provide you with the wall segments you need to play forward from there. So you still have to have some kind of management solution in place for that. Um, the, uh, the next thing you can do is um, manual backups. So call start backup on your own, copy the files across, and, and call stop backup. Uh, or you know, roll your own Perl scripts around that. Again, um, there's a lot more complexity here than you might think, and you still have the question of what to do with your wall archive. Uh, then, of course, you've got various third-party tools, OmniPitter, Barman, Wally. Um, how many people in the room are using one of those three? OK. How many people are in the room are using something they've rolled their own, themselves? We have a okay. <laughs> Uh -huh. And that's uh, based, uh, that's built using PG based backup. PG based backup, yeah. And it provides you know, the management that you need on top of PG based backup. Right. And right now we're working on incremental backup uh, for the next release. For PG based backup, yeah. Well, for our tool. Oh, for your tool. For, it's okay. called BART. Uh, right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm familiar with BART, actually. <laughs> um, and then, okay, so is there anyone in the room who's actually using PG backrest at this point? All right. Um, so of course, that's, the, uh, that's your last option. Um, sorry, I didn't actually list BART um, no because I, 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 tend, I was trying to list things that I know are free and open here. Uh, and I'm not sure about BART. Is it actually free and open source, or is it part of the, um, part of the EDB package? Um, I think it's part of the EDB package. Um, OK. I, I can check up on that. I'm happy to add it to the list, but I, I didn't think it was a, a free open source product, so that's why I'm. Uh, why I listed these. Um, and then, of course, the last one is PG Backrest. This is a, a new way to back up. Um, and we're going to talk about that and see why I think it's better than the alternatives that are out there currently. Uh, OK, so the first thing, uh, almost everyone uses rsync to do backup. Uh, rsync is great. It, it's so easy. It's so convenient. 
Um, it's beguiling. You want to use rsync because it does 95% of the job for you. All you have to really do is call start backup and stop back and stop up backup in rsync and you're good to go. The problem is rsync has a lot of limitations. Um, so one of the goals with this originally was to get away from rsync, get away from tar, get away from all these tools that would limit what we can do in the future with PG Backrest. So let's look at some of the uh, limitations. Um, first of all, rsync is single threaded. Uh, this is probably the biggest problem. Um, you know, of course you could multi-thread rsync by keeping track of everything yourself, but once you've done that, then you've done what PG Backrest has done. So, you know, why keep rsync at all at that point? Um, the other problem is it has this uh, issue with the one second, one second timestamp resolution. So this can, if you run two rsyncs in, in close proximity or you get really unlucky, uh, you can actually end up in your incremental backup, you know, your second rsync may actually miss files. This will happen if uh, the file is modified in the same second as rsync copies it originally. Uh, when it goes to, hmm? you can use the checksum based. Sorry? You can use the checksum based. You can, you're right, exactly. You can use checksums, um, and, and that and that will work, always work, of course. But you know, with your 15 terabyte databases, it's it's extremely painful. Uh, you know, if your database is large enough, you just have to go ahead and trust the timestamps, or you might as well almost do a full backup. You know, once you've got to the point of checksumming the entire database, it makes incrementals less attractive, um, except for space savings, of course. Uh, another thing about rsync is no destination compression. Uh, this is a big deal. So when, when rsync gets to the destination, it's not compressed. Furthermore, if you want to do incrementals with rsync using link dest, the previous backup also has to be uncompressed. So you could obviously move the backup and then compress everything and go on, but then you can't do an incremental. The incremental requires the previous backup be uncompressed. So now you've got two uncompressed copies of your 15 terabyte database laying around, which you know is unacceptable um, in a lot of cases. You could run it onto ZFS or something like that. You, you could do that. You could do that. Of course, that's one way to do it. Um, you know, not everyone, you know, one thing I started thinking about is a lot of Postgres ins installations are small ones. You know, they're running on just a uh, VM someplace. You know, not everyone is running kind of big metal. Um, and so I wanted a solution that sort of worked for everybody. So you can scale it all the way up. I have customers who are doing this, you know, doing uncompressed backups to ZFS, and then they can bring those up as clusters on ZFS without actually doing any kind of restore. So there's lots of options. But I was trying to like work from the, the simplest thing and scale all the way up to the biggest installations. Um, so anyway, PG Backrest doesn't, you know, in this philosophy, it doesn't use um, rsync tar or any other tools of that type. Um, it has its own protocol, which supports local and remote operation, and, um, and it solves the timestamp resolution issue. It turns out this is a fairly simple thing to do, um, and I've been thinking of recommending it to the rsync um, guys. Basically, you just wait. After you've built the manifest, you just wait for the remainder of the current second, um, and then start reading. Uh, there are some other ways to handle this that have been suggested to me as well, but I think that one's the simplest. And uh, I've shown that it works. Um, so let's go through some of the features. Uh, so compressions and checks, compression is performed and checksums are calculated in stream. Uh, so I try not to do anything in place. So if I'm you know, uh, archiving a wall file or copying a file, whatever, I don't checksum it or do anything like that first. I actually just start copying the file. Everything's done in stream. Um, obviously, that's very efficient, and it also makes it very accurate. Because um, one thing you want to know is, you know, the size of the file can change while you're copying it. It's good to know that. Um, so I've got the correct checksum, the correct size, and I can store that on the remote. Uh, there's also asynchronous compression and transfer for wall archiving. Uh, so if you have a system that's, you know, um, you know, generating wall really quickly, uh, you can actually offload that and um, and do that separately, or you can you know, um, synchronously push as well. Uh, it supports remote or local operation, um, and you don't have to do anything crazy with loopbacks, you know, SSH loopbacks or anything. It will natively work locally. So if you want to back up to, say, an NFS mount, that's kosher. Uh, you could uh, back up to a backup server. If you're doing remote operation, of course, that requires SSH to operate. Um, it has threading for parallel compression and transfer. Uh, this is an important feature, and this is one of the things that, of course, originally got us away from rsync, because um, now we can parallelize, um, and now you can dedicate as many cores to compression as you want, and you know those big backups can go a lot faster. 
Uh, there's full differential and incremental support. Yeah, go ahead. So you're doing the metal backup uh, on a file level? Yeah. Okay, and can you go over how you resolve the timestamp issue? Oh, yeah, so basically, um, in essence, you just, um, so like rsync, um, Backrest builds its, the entire manifest of the things it's going to copy right at the very beginning. Um, and so then what all I do is I wait. So let's say that happens at exactly you know, 10 o'clock, 10, uh, 10 p.m. Um, I wait, after the manifest is built, whatever second I'm currently in, I wait until the next second before I start copying. Um, and what that means is that if the, if the file is modified during that time, I'll pick up those modifications because I'm not going to start copying until the next second. And then the timestamp, you know, if it gets modified after that, of course, the timestamp will get updated. It may not get updated right then. Um, some file systems won't update the timestamps until an F-sync. Um, but I don't really care about that during that backup. The only thing I care about is that that timestamp gets modified before the next backup. Um, PG Start Backup does an F-sync. So by the time you, know, you start the next backup, you should definitely have those timestamps um, on disk. Uh, once the manifest is built, I never actually go look at any file metadata again. So like I said, I'm not concerned about that timestamp being updated. I just have to know that it's going to happen sometime down the road. Um, so yeah, differential and incremental support. Um, a lot of people ask what differential is. Differential is just like incremental, but it's always off of the last full backup. Um, they're a little more flexible because they can be expired on an easier schedule. Incrementals always depend on, the, you know, can depend on a long chain of backups. So for some applications, it's better to use differentials than incrementals. Uh, incrementals are good if you have a, just a huge day over day change. Um, and you really can't afford to accumulate that every day throughout the week between your fulls, whenever the fulls happen. Uh, there are backup and archive expiration policies. So you can define how many full backups you want, dif differential. Uh, you can define you know, whether arch where archive will expire, whether you keep archive for all the full backups or just some of the full backups. Uh, it'll still keep archive you know, to make the databases consistent, even if you're expiring archive for the older backups. Uh, backups are also resumable. So if you're halfway through a 15 terabyte backup and it dies, or you have to kill it, or you have to bring the machine down, you can actually resume that backup. Um, it'll recheck some everything that's in the backup directory to make sure that it's kosher, and then it will continue. Um, and of course, it will do those uh, checksums in threads. So if you have four, you know, you're running four threads or eight threads, it'll actually do checksums across four or eight cores to make that as fast as possible. Uh, you can also do hard linking. Um, this, is, this can be handy if you're doing uncompressed backups on ZFS. And what this means is it makes, the, one thing we'll talk about in a minute, but the, the um, directory structure of backrests is, looks like a, cons uh, the backup structure looks like a consistent Postgres cluster. Um, so you can actually point Postgres directly at a backup and bring it up and, and put, you know, it'll do recovery and it'll start running. Now, you wouldn't want to do that without taking a snapshot first, of course, because yeah, even with table spaces, yeah. Um, so what it does, it just rewrites. So it rewrites, a, it creates a base, and I'm going to talk about this in a second, so we'll just, but this is handy for that kind of thing. Um, it also works with Postgres 8.3 and above. Um, I've just put in some experimental support for 9.5, but with some of the new recovery options, I don't really have those working yet. And the regression tests do a lot of recovery scenarios, and so the regression tests are currently broken for 9.5. But by the release, of course, it will be working. Uh, so let's look at the backup structure. So th this is where, um, so it's a really uh, a clear and simple structure. Um, you have a base directory where all, which is, you know, the, the Postgres data directory, and then you'll have a table space directory where any table spaces will go, and then there is a um, file called backup backup.manifest, which is a plain text file, um, which you, is human readable or machine readable, uh, and it has information about all the files, checksums, timestamps, etc. <laughs> So what I do when I do this is um, I rewrite uh, the um, links in PG tablespace to right now I do them um, relative <laughs> you know so it's not well that that way you can move the backup directories around and they still continue to work um, Postgres is perfectly happy starting up that way it doesn't have any kind of issue you know, this isn't meant to be a production database right it's a backup but for customers that have very, very large databases that would be almost impossible to restore anywhere, it's great because you can actually just bring up the database in place. It'll do recovery. 
Um, first, you take a snapshot, of course. Take a snapshot, bring the database, database up in place, uh, do recovery, and then you can do exports, you can, you can do forensics, you can do whatever you want at that point without having to go and make a big copy of it someplace, which is a problem. Uh, yeah, so like I said, Postgres can be started in the back, directly in that backup directory if no compression is used. Uh, you can also, um, another feature is you can actually tell Backrest to copy the archive logs that are needed to make the backup consistent directly into PGX log. Um, so that way you don't even have to write a recovery.conf file or anything. If you want to do point in time recovery, of course, you're still going to have to do that. But if all you need is a consistent database, um, the, the uh, X logs you need will be right there. So very, very convenient. Um, that's an optional feature. It doesn't do that all the time because, of course, it can take up more space. So you don't necessarily want that. Um, okay, so let's look at some uh, performance numbers. So, because this is important, this is part of the, the reason why this was done is to back up very, very large databases and do it quickly. So, um, so this is a comparison I did with rsync. Um, the two programs work slightly differently, so sometimes getting them working in the same mode was a little weird in some ways. Uh, the, first, the first example works quite well, though. So in this case, uh, we're doing um, one thread. We're doing um, level three network compression. Uh, that's actually the default for backrest. Um, uh, rsync defaults to six, um, but I find that level three actually works very well because you get a lot of compression, but it's very fast. So if your destination is uncompressed, then the defaults work pretty well, but all of this is configurable, of course. What sort of compression do you use? Just, just gzip. Gzip. Yeah, I, I went with gzip just because I wanted the um, backup directories just to be very accessible to people. And so, you know, when if you are using compression, then everything's just in gzip format in the directory. So you can actually just do a recursive on gzip and bam, you've got your data back. Um, so I figured uh, there are some better uh, compression algorithms out there for speed. Um, but I, I thought I'd just go with the old standby. This is my, something that might you know, be made optional in the future, but for now, it works pretty well. Uh, so here we can see um, PG Backrest does it. Uh, so this is a, um, I'm trying to remember the size of this database. I think it was half gig or gig. I really should have written this down because now I've forgotten how big the DB was. But it was big enough to you know, get some reasonable benchmarks off of. I think it was four or 500 meg or a gig, anyway. Um, so Backrest did it in 141 seconds, and rsync did it in 124. So rsync was clearly faster. Uh, Backrest is written in Perl, um, so even though I'm using the C uh, Zlib, you know, there's still buffer management, there's protocol management, all this kind of stuff. So unfortunately, not as fast. Uh, but when, but the next thing we end up with is um, uh, multi-thread, two threads. So the settings are the same. We're still doing L3 compression, and we're doing destination, uh, no destination compression. Uh, now we're able to do this in 84 seconds. So that's 1.5 times faster than with one rsync thread. Um, and rsync, of course, is NA because it won't do multi-threading. Uh, then the next thing I did was um, one thread uh, with network compression at L6 and destination compression at L6. Uh, and here, backrest came in at 334.4, and rsync was 510. So you're saying, hey, rsync doesn't do compression, so how did you do this? Well, I compressed the files on the destination. So do rsync and then do compression, just to give you an idea of how much an advantage the in-stream compression gives you over compressing you know, on the destination. Uh, and then the last thing was to run two threads uh, and do um, the same thing, network compression, a destination compression at L6. And now we're at 2.93 2 times faster than one rsync thread. Um, so this actually scales pretty well. Uh, these benchmarks were made on my laptop, which only has two cores. Uh, and you know, of course, in this case, you've got uh, the SSH processes that are running. You've got the compression, decompression. So basically, at this point, when I, when I went, and that worked pretty well, but when I went beyond two threads, performance just kind of went down and down and down. Whereas I tested uh, a, a similar thing on a, on a client's machine, you know, much bigger machine, and I saw much better scaling in that direction. Um, and I have clients that are running up to eight threads um, for big databases. Uh, and you, know, you can keep eight cores busy <laughs> doing compression if you run it that way. So, I mean, what, what is really giving you the performance benefit there? Multi-threading or? 
Uh, yeah, well, uh, there are two things. One is um, uh, threading and also the fact that the, uh, the compression, so if, if the destination compression is set to L6, I use that same compression for network, right? So basically what happens is the, the file is compressed on the source side and then it goes across the network and then it's stored and that's it. There's no recompression on the other side. You actually just keep that compression stream and just store it to disk. That's it. Uh, checksums are done in um, stream. So you don't have to go and try to checksum that file at the end. Um, and of course, checksumming the file on disk before you copy it would be dangerous because that file could be changing you know, while you're reading it. So, uh, and also the size is calculated at the same time. So that file goes across and is stored. Now if you have destination compression turned off, then the default is to do level three compression, and then on the other side, it will uncompress it and put it on disk for you. Um, but the checksums will have still been calculated in stream, and so all you need to do is just decompress and store. Um, so it's just, just more efficient all along. So, so you can see, even with one thread, you get some advantage with the in-stream compression, and when you go to two threads, you just start multiplying that. Um, you can see it's not quite a multiple. Um, 1.5 times two should be three, 0.04, um, because there is, uh, you know, once you start doing multiple threads, now there's synchronization and messaging and all this kind of stuff being passed around. So you get a slight reduction in performance, but you can multiply that up very well. But do you think that network compression is playing a big part uh, Sorry, say again? It's, it's, a, it's a big part because, the, because I'm doing my own compression, I'm not using SSH compression, um, I can actually keep that compression on the destination side. I don't have to recompress. Um, so that, that's, that's the big advantage is just you're compressing one time, you're taking checksums one time, you're doing everything one time, and then that's it. Uh, if you want to decompress, that's fine, so you'll have compression and decompression, but you know, the usual case is to keep it compressed on the destination side. And that's where the real benefit is, just not doing things multiple times. Yeah. Exactly, and and we've seen this, um, you know, in, in in production environments where, uh, just you know, if you actually do try to say um, parallelize without compressing, uh, you can flood a network pretty quickly, <laughs> especially when you have a 32 shard cluster, doing backup and, and pushing uh, over a network, which was originally one gigabit, so that was a problem. Even a 10 gigabit network can get pretty easily flooded by that big a backup. Um, so let's, uh, let's talk just a couple minutes about living backups. So we talked about earlier about kind of why to backup, um, you know, why you need to backup. But I also have this sort of philosophy of living backups too. It, it's extremely important that your backups work when you need them. And one of the things you can do to make sure that that's true is kind of subscribe to this philosophy of find a way to use your backups, right? Don't just have them something that's just part of a DR plan. Uh, you want to find a daily way to use them. So, for instance, syncing, creating new replicas, offline reporting, um, offline data archiving. So instead of dumping, you know, May CDRs from the production database, you could actually dump them from a backup. You know, um, uh, development, all these sorts of things. Um, so, because in my opinion at least, unused code paths will not work when you need them, right? And also, if people aren't using the backups on a daily basis, they'll be unfamiliar with the procedure. You want people to be familiar with the backup tools, familiar with the restore tools, have this be just a normal thing that they deal with. So when something uh, big happens, uh, everyone knows how to deal with it, and you've got documented procedures in place, and you know your backups will work, because you're using them every day. If they don't work, you know it. You get alarms. Um, and then, of course, there are things uh, to do, uh, you know, regularly scheduled failover, instead of doing it only when you have a, a disaster situation. Um, to just test these techniques and make sure that everything actually works. Because uh, if you don't do this, um, when you actually go to use your backups, you may find that they're, you know, the, the disk got unmounted somehow, or you, know, you, you think you've been, you should have been getting alarms, but you haven't been getting alarms because some account was messed up, or monitoring was messed up, or all these sorts of things. So it's use it or lose it here, right? If you've got to use these backups, or you, or you could take the chance of losing your data. Um, so the good thing is, the thing to do is to find good ways to use your backups. And if you can do that, make it part of the life cycle of your system, then uh, when things do go wrong, you'll know what to do. Sorry, this isn't really relevant. I just really love this picture. So I try to uh, 
incorporate that whenever I can. Um, all right, so let's do a demo. Demos are fun. Uh, oops. Now, I like to script my demos. So this is, this is a real demo. So we're actually, we're going to go through and we're doing real backups and restores. But what I like to do is write a Perl program that actually goes through all the steps. That way I don't have to stand up here and try to type and mistype and, and do things poorly. But if you go to, at the end, I'll have a link. If you go to the GitHub site, um, you can actually get to this Perl program. And there's also a sample output there as well, demo.out. So that's the program run on my machine. So if you just want to see the commands, you can run through that and take a look. So it prints out all the commands and the output of all the commands that we're going to run. So uh, the first thing we're going to do here is create a cluster. Um, so we can do some testing. Uh, we're going to create a backrest.conf file. Oh, I didn't select enough. So you can run backrest entirely from the command line, but it's a lot nicer if you create a configuration file um, you know, for the things, your repository location, the location of your database, um, PSQL, if you're running on a special port, all that kind of stuff. That way you don't have to retype this stuff at the command line every time. But if you're using uh, you know, Chef or something like that that's going to write everything for you, then maybe that makes sense. Although it can make recovery kind of painful because recovery is often a manual operation. You want to be that, that to be as simple as possible. Um, and the last thing we do here is uh, uh, create a repo directory. Um, Postgres, or Backrest has a default um, var lib backrest, but it won't create that for you. You do have to create the repo directory, and if it's non, you know, not in the standard location, then you'll have to tell backrest where it lives. All right, so let's do a backup. Um, there it is. PG backrest, stanza equals main, type equals full, backup. Simple as that. Um, so now we've made a backup. Uh, we can see it here. So we've got our first full backup. Uh, we've got a backup.info file, which contains information about this backup and subsequent backups. And then latest is just a link that points to the latest backup. Heike? How does it take the backup? Does that work? Sorry? How does it take the backup? Did you start backup? It's backup, stop backup, yeah, copy files. Um, so it is, a, it is a physical backup, not a logical backup. Um, I'd like to add logical at some point, because logicals can be very handy as well, especially for large systems, but um, for now it's just a, just a physical backup. So uh, we can take a look at the size of the backup. So the size of the database was 51 meg. The size of our backup is uh, 4.9. Um, you shouldn't expect to generally get this kind of compression, and obviously since I just created the cluster, almost all these files are zeroed out. So they're very, very small, and you get a very, very efficient backup. Uh, the next thing is this backup info file. So there's a whole, I'm not going to go through all of this, but there's a whole bunch of information in here about uh, this backup, um, you know, the archive start and stop, uh, the actual size of the original database, its size in the repo, et cetera, et cetera. We'll see a, a nice form of this later. You can actually export all this data as JSON. Yep. Well, the, the threads are actually uh, enabled just to copy files, just to check some and copy files. So the, you know, the, the, the main part of the program and all the control stuff is done in, in a single master thread, uh, the, the main process. And the threads are brought up to, so then what I do is I build a manifest. Um, I segregate things by table space so that the threads can actually you know, work on a different table spaces. So if you have four table spaces and four threads, then each one is going to initially work on its own table space. Uh, as you start to run out of files, threads will, will bounce along and, and start working on other table spaces as well. Generally speaking, compression is your biggest bottleneck, not I.O. So you can actually have multiple threads running on a single table space, but you wouldn't want all eight of them on one table space, you know, certainly not initially. Yep. So still some configuration steps before this, if you do something in Postgres, before you can run the backup, like Yeah, let me, um, I, sh I should have, uh, maybe I should have pointed that out. It's right here in uh, PGCTL. So, so in this case, what I've done is I've turned archive mode on, 
uh, wall level equals archive, and then here's the archive command here. PG backrest stands a main archive push. So backrest has full archive management built in. Uh, you're not SCPing files anywhere, or copying them and having you picked up. Backrest takes the uh, ar um, archive file from cradle to grave. Uh, you know, if it's asynchronous, it'll be stored locally and pushed up later, or we're not doing asynchronous archiving here. But it's, it's checksummed as soon as it's pulled off a disk, um, and that checksum follows it for its entire lifetime, so you can verify that it's correct, and et cetera. So yeah, the, so that's the, the setup. And the documentation, of course, too, it'll tell you the basic setup of um, backrest on Postgres. Uh, the good thing about this demo is it's also, I mean, it will show you every step of setting this thing up and running it, including creating the Postgres cluster. Um, so we're pretty much through here. I mean, this, there's a lot of information about your, uh, your database here. So if you, say, misconfigure your system and you start doing a backup from system B to system A's repo, Backrest will fail. It'll tell you, it'll say, hey, you know, the system IDs don't match here, the database version IDs don't match, something is, is horribly wrong. It'll also do that for wall. It reads the wall headers for versions 8.3 through 9.5, and it will tell you if you're archiving to the wrong repo. Um, so it's just a handy thing. You know, sometimes you can fat finger configurations, or you copy a file from one place to another, and suddenly you're mixing archive log, and that would be very bad. Yes? Um, I, I haven't uh, directly, and, and the reason is, um, uh, well, I try not to be controversial to some extent. <laughs> um, but also, you know, Barman is actually based on rsync, so I think by comparing to rsync, I've compared to Barman uh, pretty easily. Um, you know, the, the same thing is true. I could definitely do some comparisons with base backup, although I think it'd be pretty clear you know, how that's going to work out because base backup, of course, isn't threaded. Base backup will at least compress compress and stream, so that's good, and leave you with a compressed copy. Uh, so that's something, but I think you're going to find that the performance would be very similar to single-threaded backrest performance. Um, but I, I should do some more benchmarks. I just haven't been directly comparing. Also, like, Wally uh, is a very special use case because it's, it's compressing locally and then pushing to S3. So I know it's, it's really hard to compare those two. They're, they're different use cases. Until I have S3 support, it would be kind of disingenuous to try to make a comparison there. Of course, backrest will be faster, but that doesn't mean that Wally is not doesn't have its own value. But when, you, when you're multi-threading uh, sort of an OLTP system, does that create an overhead on the um, Yeah, uh, it definitely can. So um, what, one of the things I'll, I'm working on for, uh, I'll be working on this summer is, is backups from standbys. Um, which is relatively easy to do. It's just more of a configuration problem than anything else because now backrest has to be aware of your standby and some other things like that. Um, generally speaking, uh, like I said, the, the, the whole backup process is very CPU bound. Um, so IO just doesn't tend to be as much of a problem. If you've got a machine with 32 cores, then on the weekends, hopefully, you can spare some of those to do, you know, help you do the full backup. Uh, but if you don't, if you, the thing, about, the thing about backup is backup can be slow, right? If you're doing one full backup a week and maybe a couple of incrementals or a couple of differentials, I mean, you can really afford to spend two days creating a full backup, right? Uh, so what really needs to be fast is restore, right? And in that case, you can actually, you should be able to dedicate the resources to, uh, so now I'm going to do a restore. I've got the compressed data someplace else. It'll come across the network compressed and it'll be uncompressed on the destination machine. So now I might say, well, hey, I'm going to dedicate eight cores to this you know, to getting these checksums done and get this uh, across. So you can have massive performance improvements in Restore with parallelism. Um, with backup, it's more of a convenience thing. You know, how long do you want to spend backing up? Um, if you've got enough cores to support it and you've got enough I.O. to support it, you know, if you've got a lot of disk sets, um, a lot of table spaces, then, you know, one, you know, I work on systems that, you know, have minimum of eight table spaces. So if you're doing eight cores on that, each core is working on its own table space uh, and you've, you've got one sequential read coming off of a single ta you know, table space, which isn't that bad, uh, as long as you have IOs, IO isolation, of course. Um, this is the, uh, uh, let's see how we're doing on time. I'm pretty good. Um, this is the archive directory. Uh, so you can see the archive files, uh, your wall segments have been copied over. Um, each one has a SHA-1 checksum attached to it, um, which, like I said, stays with it forever, uh, so that you can verify that the, um, 
And when the archive files are actually, uh, if they're requested, uh, when they're copied back and decompressed, they're actually checksummed on the way. So if there's something wrong with the archive file, you're going to find out about it before. If it's been corrupted in place in the repo, uh, you'll, you'll get an error from Backrest about that rather than having Postgres potentially. I mean, Postgres would also detect it um, because the checksums in wall would be bad and it would know it and there would be a problem, but you'll find out in advance. Um, and here's the uh, same sort of thing before. You've got this information file, uh, which tells you all kinds of things about the um, wall archive and make sure that you don't mix wall between multiple versions. Uh, let's see here. Oh, and also you can see that wall is stored in its own version directory. Uh, and this means I haven't written these functions yet. So right now, uh, previously in Postgres, if you wanted to upgrade to a new version, you would actually create a new stanza and then start backing up there. Uh, here, now you're going to be able to just uh, issue an upgrade command to backrest. With the, once you've done the upgrade, it'll read the new information, it'll store that, and then it'll start accepting wall from that new um, database. That way you don't have to, you can still do expiration across multiple versions, you could pin the last version, do some things like that. So these are things that are on the way. Um, now, now we're gonna do a differential backup. Uh, so we can see now that we've, now we've got a, a new backup type. So it's based on the full backup, but it ends with a D. So it's a differential backup. Latest has been upgrade, updated to that. And now we can see we've got more archive. Now, if you might recall, our previous backup was 4.9 meg. Adding the differential only brings us up to 5.1. So this is good. This is, this is where incremental really starts to save you. And if you've got you know, particularly very large databases that with a lot of partitioning where you're creating new partitions every day but you're not modifying the old ones, this can just be a lifesaver. It, in, it incredibly reduces the size of your backup. Um, for very large data, incremental is an absolute must. Um, I don't, I, I have an open issue to do, to allow you to specify checksums. Right now it is based on, backups are based on timestamp. Restores are always based on checksum unless you force them off. Um, the theory being here when you've got a, a, you know, kind of a normally operating database that, you know, checksums are good and you can trust them. If you're doing a restore, by definition, something's kind of gone wrong and you may not know what and you may not be able to trust your timestamps. So in a restore, checksums are always used. Uh, if you do a, the default for restore is uh, Backrest expects the restore directory to be empty, right? That's the default. But you can, uh, there's a dash dash delta option you can use where it'll say, okay, I'll, I'm gonna look at, I'm gonna check some what you have, compare it to the manifest, and only copy what I need to. Uh, and this can be very efficient with multiple threads because you can check some on multiple threads and then you pull from the repo only what you want. Um, so I've seen examples of the one customer with a relatively small database, 30 gig, um, but with, with four threads, they can do restores in under a minute um, you know, from, from the NFS mount because you look, most of the database is the same, you copy what you need, whereas a full restore takes about six minutes. So, uh, but that's on one thread actually. So, uh, where are we? Oh yeah, so, um, all right, so now, now it's release time, right? We're gonna do a release. Uh, before this, we decide to do an incremental backup that way, if we need to do some kind of restore, we don't have to replay a lot of wall segments. If you, if you generate a lot of wall, you'll want to go ahead and do an incremental here. Um, and to show that we, uh, where we are, we're going to uh, insert a message in our test table saying, oh, um, before release. So we've inserted this message before release. We create a restore point. We do the release. Uh, and then we update the message to say after release. So this would be a version table or something. My databases always have a version table. So after the release, that version would be updated and you know that you're on the new version of the DB. Um, and now, so QA says, okay, the release, the release is no good. Please roll back. Uh, so now we're gonna call restore uh, and immediately get an error because Backrest won't try to attempt to do a restore while Postgres is running. So we're gonna need to, <laughs> Stop the database and try again. Uh, so now we do our restore, we start the cluster, and we check for the message. So we did a, um, let's actually look at the restore. So we did uh, stanza main, uh, type equals name, target equals release, dash dash delta. All right, so this is a, a delta restore based on um, point in time recovery to 
uh, that name. And what you can see, Backrest actually writes the recovery comp file for you um, so that you don't have to do that because it has all the information it needs to do it, although you can override stuff if you want on the command line. And now we can see we've gotten back to before the release. Excellent. Um, but then we also, oh yeah, I forgot, uh, it was part of the script. So, so we got back to where we were before the release, we bring things back up, and then this very important update comes in, right? Well now, QA actually says, you know what, we made a mistake, uh, the release was fine, just go back to that point after the release. Rather than trying to reapply everything and keep everyone up all night, we'll just, we'll go back to that point in time. So we can do that by, um, Right, so in this case, we just do a, a, a plain restore. So this is a default restore, which is going to take us to the end of the wall stream. Right, and so now we'll be back to the where we were after the release, and we can see the message here after release. Uh, well, now, uh-oh, so what about that very important update? Now that's gone. So now we're back to after the release where we wanted to be, but we've lost that very important data that got inserted to the database. So now, on, on this system or another system, we'd probably do this on another system. So this is an example of lost data you know, being found with a backup. So maybe on another system, we do this instead. So now we, we, we're going to do a restore, but this time we're going to follow a different timeline. Uh, we're going to follow the timeline that was created um, after that first restore recovery that we did to get back before the release. So that was timeline two. So we're going to recover onto timeline two and Voila, there it is. There's our very important update um, on timeline two. And we can do this on another server, uh, P, you know, dump the table out and bring it into production. We could do this on production, lots of options, right? But you have lots of options to get places. Um, and like I said, Backrest takes care of writing all your config files for you and all this kind of stuff. So it's a very simple command line operation to get to any point that you want. Um, here's some uh, info. So if you uh, if you use the info function, it will give you kind of a summary of the current status of the backups, oldest backup, latest backup, stuff like that. This isn't really very interesting. Um, this is a lot more interesting. If you do output equals JSON, uh, it'll give you a really, really comprehensive set of data about your repository, sizes, uh, um, you know, which backups reference which, um, timestamps, uh, you name it all kinds of information. And this can be used to feed monitoring or some kind of admin program or you name it. There's a ton of information here and as I get more I'll be adding it um, to this structure of course. Uh, and afterwards we stop the cluster, clean up, and the demo is complete. Go back to this. So, just done. Um, so that's all I got. Are there any questions? Sure. How do we compare it to this technique we have in the data spread across multiple data structures? I'm guessing, I'm guessing you're sort of parallelizing uh, across table spaces. You yeah. Know, you kind of got one thread going through each table space. Yeah, if you, uh, it, it actually, so if, if there are multiple table spaces and you specify multiple threads, Backrust will make its best attempt to balance them you know, put, put one thread, so if you've got four table spaces and four threads, it's going to at least initially start by pointing each a thread at a separate table space to do its, you know, reading and compression. Um, as, as you work your way down, let's say one table space, if they're not symmetric, uh, then you're going to start running into issues where it, it's going to run down and, and multiple threads are going to end up on the same table space. Um, I've generally found from an I.O. perspective, you can still get away with, you know, several threads on one table space without it depends on how busy your system is, um, but compression is generally the bottleneck here, not uh, read I.O. But, but so it does end up having eventually multiple threads working on a single Yeah. Table so, table. yeah, what, what I want to do is add an option to, you know, sort of a max, you know, per table space sort of option. So if you have two table space, or, you know, if it, if it gets to that point, it would only maybe run two threads on that last table space or something like that. I'm, I'm kind of thinking about setting some maximums um, especially if you're doing eight and it all devolves down to one table space, then that can end up getting a little bit hairy. Okay. Uh, actually, this is a question for the room because this is something we're struggling with. I'm running 12 off one table space and I'm doing multi threaded ripping of something called JC. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, honestly, I, that's the thing is I find I'm so deeply in my backups, my biggest problem. Yeah, and, and that, that's what. That, 
that's why I haven't, it hasn't been a big deal for me yet because I haven't seen any problems with it in the field. And we're, we're always just massively CPU limited on the backups and it just, it ends up not being that much of a problem. Josh? Yeah, we're often limited by, net, on, on some of the larger sites, we're often limited by network I.O. and bandwidth. As well, yeah. Um, I've seen, Um, but it's it's when you're doing your transfer over of SSH, you're still using SSH compression on the network, though. Barman. If you set it up that way. If you set it up that way, okay. Yeah, I mean, I we've seen network as the um, bottleneck as well. Like I said, that 32 shard cluster I was talking about could could saturate the network, um, but usually it's CPU. Right. Is this is it possible to take those um, incrementals that you have here and do that kind of thing? You, could it be extended to do that? You, you absolutely could, um, but it, it, it kind of goes against the philosophy, if you will, of, of full backups. Because the idea of a full backup is that every once in a while you're just going to go back and copy all the data again so you're, you're sure that it was right. Um, you could definitely roll things along, you know, backups to another, or you could do, you know, Right. Right. You can. Well, what I would probably do in that case is do full backup, then maybe do weekly differentials, and then hang daily incrementals off of those differentials. Um, yeah, take. I, I understand that's kind of interim. I was just yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. You could do that. What? A, what? A, the next step that I really would like to do is do a, a sub file incrementals based on checksums. Um, so, because right now, if, if a file's changed, I'm copying the whole file, and this can be painful for one gig uh, extent. So, I'm going to be using checksums to actually copy parts of files. So you want the sub file? So you're actually copying the whole two gig file? Exactly. Exactly. I mean, files are already broken up into one gig segments, so you get some. Advantage, unlike Oracle table spaces, which can be quite, <laughs> quite massive. So, yep, uh, Ike first. Um, you mentioned checksums a few times. Uh, can you explain more where we can calculate these checksums? Yeah, they're actually so they're calculated in the in the, in the protocol layer, and they're actually SHA one checksums. Uh, so I'm not actually. Hmm? What do you checksum? I'm I'm just checking checksumming the entire file. Uh, as it comes across. So this isn't related to the wall checksums or the data file checksums. Um, those aren't always available. Obviously, I have support all the way back to 8.3. So for the main backrest checksums, I wanted to do something that would be compatible across all versions of Postgres. But I would like to do, you know, add support for 9.3 and greater databases to, you know, if you've got checksums turned on, do more intelligent. I, I could still obviously checksum the blocks myself and make that compatible backwards. But I'd like to use what Postgres has there. And also, one nice thing is you could tell Backrest to basically check all the checksums in your database when it does a backup to make sure, you know, if you're doing a full backup anyway and you've got all that data in your hands, it seems like a good opportunity to check some your tables and, and see that the checksums match. That way, if, if they don't, uh, the backup will still succeed if they don't match, but you'll get some alarm bells going, hey, you know, I found bad checksums. They weren't in the last database. Uh, you know, the last backup, you might want to think about uh, doing some, you know, a restore here and some recovery. So Postgres doesn't actually guarantee that when you're doing a backup, you do a full backup. It's not guaranteed that the checks will match the response. Right, that's, that's exactly... Then we try a few times. Yeah, that's exactly what we're... Um, it's kind of an experiment we want to do first, because obviously the pages are 8K. 
Um, so we're worried that the checksums may not actually match up with the page in, in, you know, for things that are actively being written. Um, but at the same time, because we're on a live system, we're not sure if the kernel will present us with a torn page or not. So it, it, a little bit of experimentation and research is required there, but it's definitely a direction we're interested in going. Yes, sir. Um, well, the uh, backrest will actually write the recovery comp file for you. So wall, of course, is stored in an archive off with the backups. So the, um, rec the recovery command will actually uh, retrieve the wall from the archive for you uh, for Postgres. You're also welcome to write your own recovery comp file. Uh, you can, there's an option to preserve the current recovery comp file. So if you've already got a complicated one in place and you're doing a restore, uh, you can just preserve the current one. Uh, you may have your wall on S3. You might have, so Backrest doesn't assume that your wall is going to be managed by Backrest. Um, it may not be, it may be someplace else. Maybe only your backups are back, managed by Backrest. Uh, but in the default case, Backrest will actually automatically retrieve the, the wall for you. From the, from the wall archive, uh, which is stored beside the backups, um, or wherever you tell it to be stored. It could be stored in a separate repo, but generally it's stored in the same repo as the backups. Yeah. Uh, the, the archive command is always in Postgres. So uh, Backrest will continue to archive even when a backup isn't running. It doesn't, it's not going to do it just during the backup. It's always going to be keeping track of your wall for you, um, e e whether a backup is running or not. Because the archive command that we saw at the beginning uh, is given to Postgres, you know, the Backrest archive command. So it's going to be continuously archiving no matter what is going on. Every time a, a wall is pushed from Postgres, it'll archive it. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, if, if you're, you know, I see people who don't have archiving solutions in place, they set up streaming replication. They're like, oh, well, I'll just stream. It'll be fine. And, and it's not. It gets desynchronized, and then that's it. They have to do a base backup, or they have to do something drastic. If you, if you have good archive management in place, you don't run into that problem. Um, you can just, uh, yep. Well, this, this is what I was saying. In, in the docs, I actually address this, but if you're, if you're doing this on ZFS, you must take a snapshot. Well, if you, if you so let's say you did that. Let's say you brought up a cluster on an incremental without doing a, um, uh, a restore. You're going to corrupt not only the incremental, but the previous full differential. If you've got hard linking turned on, like the whole set's going to be gone. So yeah, that's a pretty stupid thing to do. Um, there's no way for me to prevent that because I don't have hooks into the file system. What will happen though is if you did a recovery on that backup, it would not work. Um, it would say, no, the checksums don't match up. Uh, these aren't the correct files. Something went wrong. And so you, won't, you would not get an inconsistent recovery from that situation. But you can certainly go in. You can go into the backup directory and just delete files. There's, there's nothing I can do to prevent that. The only thing I can do is when you actually go to do a recovery, it'll tell you, no, this is no good, sorry. <laughs> I can't use this backup. You've got you know, you to pick something else. Um, I will also be working on a validate function to just go and validate a backup. You know, just offline, say, I just, just tell me that the backup is still good before I do a recovery. That's a really simple thing. It's just kind of, uh, you know, so many features, so little time, right? So how would you get if the backup is still good? Hmm? Uh, because I, I'm going to read those files off it, because uh, every time something is transferred, it's checksummed. So when I read the backup off of disk, uh, you know, uh, read that backup, I'm going to transfer the file across, and while it's coming across and is decompressed on the database side, it's going to get checksummed at that point. Well, I also have the checksums in the manifest, you know, that I originally wrote into that manifest file. So if those two things don't match, that's it. Um, you know, recovery is, is failed, uh, and you'll get an error back. Josh, did you have a question? Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's sorry. That's what that um, that's what that last thing was. Uh, that information function. Um, so that gives you your 
Unfortunately, it's gone now. Let me um, uh, let's see here. Uh -huh. Repo. Let me just look at demo dot out. Oh come on, harder than it should be. Uh, so yeah, here at the end. Um, so if you run the uh, info function with output to JSON. This will give you the exhaustive list of, so here's the stanza uh, main. Uh, it gives you status code, okay, da da da. It gives you information about the database in that, in that stanza. And then in this backup list is an array of all the backups with all the information, start, stop, for archive, um, the format, you know, the version of backrest that did the backup, the database ID, which you can reference in that database section. Uh, information about the you know size, deltas, uh, labels, you know the label of the backup, the prior backup, any references to previous backups, uh, the timestamp of the start and stop, uh, and and the type. So this is a differential, and you can follow this down. And so here's here's the incremental, and the incremental of course has a. Oh wait, that that's a diff. That's an incremental. It's weird. I would expect to see that prior. It doesn't look quite right. Huh, well. Um, anyways, yep. Yeah. Which OS does it support? Which? Uh, well, currently, I mean, uh, it should run on any flavor of Linux. Uh, right now, the, um, the threading implementation uses Perl iThreads, uh, which some systems don't support, like Gen2 Linux doesn't compile with threads. Um, I'm working on taking the threads out right now and replacing them with processes. Um, I'm right in the middle of that. It requires changes of the protocol layer, some abstractions there. So I'm working on that. And then everything will be done in processes. I really already do that because the remote is a process that I start on the other system to do the protocol layer stuff. So basically, I'm going to have instead just have sort of local remotes you know, that do the compression and copying and get rid of threads altogether. And that should uh, increase the compatibility a lot. But for async archiving, I'm also forking, which Windows doesn't like. So I'm going to have to find a way to uh, just do that differently, do that as an exact, you know, something that Windows will be happy with. Um, I, I haven't really gotten any kind of Windows <laughs> compatibility yet, so there's definitely that issue. Any other questions? I think we're pretty far over time. All right, great. Well, thank you very much.